Welcome. Hi, my name is Tomo. I'm really glad you're all joined here. Hopefully you're here for a um, wonderful workshop that we bracket for two hours, but we normally finish in about 90 minutes. And it is an intro to Kubernetes and GitOps, uh, through which hopefully you're here, maybe you're just getting started with Kubernetes, you've heard this term GitOps, um, maybe you've read some stuff, but you're not sure um, what's the best way to um, really get started up and running. Um, or you've been meaning to do this and sometimes it's just hard to carve out time. So you're like, great, <laughs> there's a window, I'm gonna sit through this, there's a free workshop um, and uh, I want to um, be able to try things out. So hopefully if you're any or all of the above, this is the perfect place for you to come because we will have a combo of short talks um, covering these various topics and really important things that you need to know, um, as well as actually getting you through the steps. Uh, if you've heard of the um, CNCF project Flux, uh, it's an open source uh, project that's in the CNCF and we're very close to graduation. Uh, we will be using that, um, but also be using kind of a teaching tool to get you up and running with Flux in as quick as 30 minutes. Uh, um, but if you get stuck, we've got a team here um, so that we will troubleshoot with you. So hopefully none of you will be shy about raising your hand about where you're stuck or need a little extra time. Um, we are here to make sure that everybody in the end is able to complete the steps. Um, we've got plenty of time. Like I said, uh, we bracket two hours and even with all the troubleshooting and stuff, we're usually done in about 90 minutes. So hopefully um, you will leave this workshop both having understood sort of some core concepts around Kubernetes and what it is and why um, GitOps and Kubernetes are very closely intertwined um, and how GitOps is one very natural evolution of Kubernetes. Um, and we'll also show you, hopefully you've got problems that you want solved and we will show you how we will um, help you solve those problems. So I'm looking at all the people signing up, excellent. Um, so my name is Tamo Nakahara. I lead the developer experience team here at a company called Weaveworks. Uh, I'm very happy to have with us um, both Mark Emos and David Stauffer, um, who is a principal engineer and also um, senior product manager here, walking you through the various steps. So we will be kind of coming in and out to give you talks, um, help, and then going through the getting started steps so that at the end, you will know what GitOps is, understand some core concepts around it and you'll actually be doing GitOps, uh, and then we'll leave you with like the next steps around like disaster recovery and helm charts and all these great things that hopefully you can then um, take the next steps to do um, and then we will always be in our slack channel to help you or if you had to leave early or got stuck uh, and we couldn't fix you fix the problems within the uh, 90 minutes we will continue to help you online so hopefully that's clear um, and please yeah ask us any questions. So I mentioned the three of us and uh, Stacy that you might see here as our host, our trusted uh, community manager who puts together these wonderful workshops. Uh, we all work for a company called Weaveworks. Um, if you haven't heard of us, uh, welcome. If, you've, if you are new to this series, um, thanks for joining and check out our meetup page, which is the best place for all future talks. Um, our website is at weave.works and um, we have paid products, but we also have um, so much that's uh, around open source. Our company has really, really been founded on open source with many, many projects out there. Um, many of you may have heard of WeaveNet from the early days. Um, and now we've really focused primarily on uh, Flux and Flagger. So Flagger is a project within Flux. Uh, uh, Cortex is another that came out of us um, and both have been in the CNCF and many, many more. Um, but Flux is really the project that um, we created for ourselves, for our own particular needs, but it really was the, um, the project that sparked the term GitOps, which our CEO coined and put out there, and it's pretty much kind of taken off like crazy. Um, and then uh, built on that uh, has also been Flagger from one of the people on our team, Stefan Prodan, um, who saw this opportunity and a, and a, a gap where you could also do like canary deployments, blue green deployments, leveraging all of these GitOps uh, concepts and tooling. Um, so there's so much around that that um, we've built. So again, if you're new, check out our website, weave.works. Um, and yeah, let us know if you have any questions. So some housekeeping, as I mentioned, we've got Mark, David, and me, who will be um, walking you through these steps. 
Um, by now, I think you all know how to use Zoom. Um, but the main thing here is make sure that you choose uh, to everyone when you're in the chat box. So the chat uh, will be the way that you can ask us questions. Um, you can also raise your hand, um, but sometimes it's hard for us to respond. So it's good to put in a chat and I will be monitoring that. Uh, and yeah, make sure it's to everyone unless you have something that's burning, burningly uh, private. Uh, excellent. So overall, like I said, here's our agenda. We will um, cover the um, intro to Kubernetes and GitOps. Um, and then uh, we will go through the steps uh, right before that. I'll give just like a, a, a quick overview. Um, and sorry, it says we've GitOps here because that's our teaching tool to get you um, up and running with Flux super quick. Um, and these are the uh, links that Stacy will put into the chat uh, when we start the workshop. So with that, um, let's move over to Mark Emice, who will give us a fantastic talk on um, what is, if you're new, what is Kubernetes? Uh, why is it connected to GitOps? And um, what are the things to know? No pressure. <laughs> All right, take it away. All right. Uh, thanks, Tamo, for that uh, introduction there. Uh, so as Tamo mentioned, uh, I am going to be talking about uh, uh, giving a, uh, I'm going to say 50,000 foot view of Kubernetes itself, uh, and then talk a little bit about GitOps and talk about how uh, the two relate uh, together so well. And as Tamo mentioned, you know, it's kind of kind of the impetus of us creating GitOps uh, originally uh, uh, a few years back. Sometimes when I'm talking uh, and I can't see anybody, I'll end up talking fast. And if you find me talking too fast and you need me to slow down, please uh, post a message in the chat and somebody will uh, ping me and hopefully tell me to uh, slow it down a little bit. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, get started. So again, I'm going to cover a uh, high level uh, introduction on Kubernetes and GitOps. So a little bit about me. So I am a principal engineer here at Weaveworks. I've been working in the software industry for 30 plus years at this point, and the last five have really been focused on containers and Kubernetes. Uh, if you need to reach me, I'm on Twitter at Mark e. Mice. Uh, GitHub is a pale mountain writer, and uh, you can, of course, email me here at Weeborks, mark.emice. And if you join our community Slack that we have here, uh, I'm just Mark E on that. So. So let's go through a little bit of background here on Kubernetes itself. Uh, so uh, everybody sh hopefully is familiar with containers at this point, be it Docker containers or anything that's an OCI compliant containers. Uh, Kubernetes is, is kind of foundational for uh, creating uh, clusters of containers. So container clusters is one way that people describe it, but it's really kind of the modern ops stack, uh, if you will, uh, of the cloud. And so uh, that base building block is that container, and that's what we're going to be. Uh, it's foundational for understanding that it is containers underneath the covers. Uh, but in addition to Kubernetes itself has a core API that allows you to interact with the, the infrastructure that is Kubernetes along with all of your objects itself. And we're gonna talk more about this uh, as we go along in the presentation, but some fundamental pieces uh, would be something called namespaces inside of Kubernetes. What this is, is the allow, it allows you to kind of segregate your Kubernetes space uh, and you'll be running different uh, uh, workloads in those namespaces. Uh, those workloads are comprised of pods. So pods is the base building block inside of Kubernetes itself. Uh, and a pod contains one or more containers. So we were talking up there uh, just a second ago about containers there, but pods are your base building block and everything is gonna resolve uh, or revolve around uh, pods inside of your Kubernetes environment. Uh, in addition to that, you're going to have services. So services are uh, the way pods communicate with each other, and they can also be used for external communication in. Uh, they're used as part of the chain of making your pods accessible externally. But these are some really high level things 
uh, or really they're low level things, but they're core components of a Kubernetes system itself. But there's a lot more in there. So there's events, there's secrets, uh, there's configuration. If your app needs storage, you need a way to talk to storage. If you need networking, so if you're talking between different pods, there needs to be a solution for networking. Uh, how do I discover other pods or other services available? So there's gotta be a, sub a discovery aspect to it. Uh, you can do jobs, you can do cron jobs. So all sorts of things in this uh, ecosystem that is Kubernetes itself. Um, in addition to having a bunch of primitives in there that you get to leverage as you're building your applications, uh, you can extend it itself. So Kubernetes includes something called cl uh, custom resource definition or CRDs as I'll be referring to them here. Uh, and basically a CRD is a definition of an, of an object that you want in your Kubernetes space. And then you build a controller that drives it through its life cycle and is really responsible for that object. But the key component of having that CRD aspect is now that the core API server that you use in Kubernetes allows you to talk to your uh, custom resource definitions inside the system itself. So it's a nice extensible model uh, if the base building blocks don't provide everything you, that you need uh, in your system. And we'll, we'll touch on the fact that uh, Flux itself, which is the underpinnings of Weave GitOps, is uh, several controllers that are running in there. So they're going to have CRDs and you're going to interact with them just like you would any other object inside of Kubernetes. So GitOps itself. So when I think about all of those pieces that I just laid out, if you're building a distributed application, you're going to need secrets. You're going to need a configuration map. You're going to need uh, a set of different stateless services inside there. You're going to need a service. You may need to expose it through ingress. Uh, you may need all sorts of things that you may or may not have heard of before, but all of those are aspects of your distributed application. I like to think of them in my mind, uh, Kind of to a video game Tetris, uh, I tried to make it uh, tied to Dragon Slayer, which is a game I played as a kid, but I couldn't make it. So Tetris uh, lines up better with me thinking of those blocks and how you manipulate all of those together uh, to get those lines and to fill in a whole gap there. Uh, well, what GitOps is going to help you do is once you've figured out that line and have that working, uh, you can snap that into Git, right? And that helps you manage all of those different pieces of complexity in your Kubernetes cluster itself. So it's uh, the, <clears throat> your GitOps solution, you'll want it to be a cloud native solution because, well, Kubernetes is a cloud native solution. So you want to make sure that you don't have any kind of impedance mismatch between the GitOps solution that you're choosing and your applications and your environment that you're running all that stuff in there together. So uh, as the name implies, GitOps, uh, Git is a key portion of it, but it's not strictly Git. What it really is, is version controlled and immutable storage or immutable resources. So the key component is I need to be able to get back to an exact version of what it is I'm running on my cluster, right? So that exact definition, that exact line in Tetris, if you will, if you're familiar with the game, I need to be able to get back to exactly that. That's what I'm referring to when we talk about Git. Git happens to be a, the, a perfect resource for it, but it's not the only one that fits there. And the second piece, <clears throat> excuse me, with GitOps would be the ops aspect of it. So uh, we're going to need things like continuous delivery, uh, declarative configuration, and automation. Uh, declarative, declarative configuration is, is a really key aspect, and we're going to talk a lot more about that as we proceed through the slides. So let's talk a little bit more about Kubernetes. So I'm going to focus more on how Kubernetes operates on here and not specifically on individual uh, building blocks of Kubernetes itself. You'll need all those building blocks for your cloud native application, but I'm going to talk about kind of the lower level aspects in here. So when somebody asks me, either somebody uh, in the computer industry or sometimes my wife, right, what is a Kubernetes? Uh, and I've responded with at least all of these and probably many more. So it's a platform for distributed application, or it's a platform of platforms, or it's a modern cloud platform, or it's an open source platform for operations, or right a platform for hosting 12-factor applications. If you haven't heard of 12-factor applications, I, I would encourage you to check out 12factor.net. It really is a, a set of 12 uh, principles that you want to use as you're building cloud native applications. Really a useful piece there. So when I describe Kubernetes with all of these aspects, there's one piece that's that's kind of common on all of them, and that's that it's a platform. 
right? So depending on how you want to phrase it, it really is a platform. If you think about building a distributed application and running it uh, in a Linux environment, let's say, uh, there's all sorts of things you'll have to put together. If you have machines, you'll need an OS, you'll need networking between those machines. So you'll have to figure out all that. If you're going to have storage, well, is it storage local to the machine? Is it a NAS? All of those kind of things you'll have to figure out. And that would be your quote platform. Kubernetes is providing that for you for your distributed applications. So uh, Kubernetes itself is open source software. Uh, it did come out of Google, uh, but it's managed currently by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation or CNCF that is part of the Linux Foundation. Um, and that's important uh, so that you know when you're uh, building and using a Kubernetes that there's a whole group, a whole community around managing it and driving that forward. It's not a single entity uh, that's doing it. It is a consortium. And guess what? Everybody's invited to participate uh, in the, the, the direction that Kubernetes is going in and fixing bugs and doing all that sort of thing. Uh, when you look at Kubernetes itself, it's really going to break down into a few key high level building blocks and that's the there's a control plane for managing Kubernetes itself. So there's a there's things like a kubelet and things like that that run uh, the workloads inside Kubernetes and then we need something to manage that that's the control plane. There's a data plane, which is used for your individual workloads that you run inside of Kubernetes. So how do, the, how do you manage that? And then there's an API server that exposes both of those uh, so that you can manipulate your workloads and manipulate both the control plane and the data plane. And remember when I talked about CRDs or custom resource definitions, those are also exposed through that API server. So you have a nice single point of entry to your platform for managing uh, your distributed application space that you're working with. So I talked a little bit about being open source and CNCF. Uh, when something's open source, uh, vendors are gonna come in and fill the space and they're gonna provide uh, multiple quote distributions for uh, the software, which is a good thing, right? You wanna have uh, many people doing that, but without some kind of conformance testing, which there is on Kubernetes, you can't be assured that the workload or application you build uh, in one environment is gonna work in another environment. So uh, we've seen this a lot with like dev, uh, dev stages. I don't know how many times you've heard where uh, you're working with an engineer and they say, well, it worked on my machine, you know, kind of throwing up their hands. Uh, you really don't want that when you're talking about the platform that you're using your system. So when, you, when you're when you dealing with that, you want to make sure you have some kind of assurance that you can, you know, I'll, I'll say, you know, write the application run it once and run it on multiple environments here. But that's one of the things that conformance testing is going to provide you. Now, that doesn't mean that all environments work the same. They mostly work the same. And when I say environments, uh, today we're going to talk about something called Kubernetes in Docker or kind clusters. Uh, that's running on your local desktop uh, all the way to GKE or EKS, right? And those Kubernetes environments, they're going to be, if you're talking about the same version, are going to run mostly the same. Uh, where they're going to differ is things like touch points to the outside world. So when you need to get traffic into your cluster, uh, that, that behavior will be different between a kind cluster, a, a, a GKK cluster, or an EKS cluster. So uh, conformance testing is really key. When choosing a distribution, you want to make sure it passes those conformance tests. So one of the key things uh, that is fundamental inside of Kubernetes itself is this concept of desired state. So when you're building objects uh, for Kubernetes, you're setting uh, what you want, not how you want it running on the system. So uh, when building out a, an application, let's say it's a, it's a web service, you just wanna say, I want this web service running on this system and I wanna be able to access it via this port. You don't tell it, you know, hey, I want you to uh, write IP tables entries so that I can expose that port. You let the platform handle that for you. So that's where that declarative configuration is so crucial here. And it turns out that declarative configuration is what allows us to plug in GitOps so seamlessly uh, for this uh, environment here. I talked a little bit around CRDs and controllers. So when you define your new object, you're gonna have a controller. Well, it turns out that controller concept uh, that's driving your uh, custom resource is the same mechanism or similar mechanism for all of the Kubernetes primitives itself. So there's a general life cycle that's gonna happen. There's controllers that drive it. Uh, and when you work with uh, customers uh, or products and other uh, open source projects and things like Flux, like we talk about, there will be controllers that know how to deal with their objects. And all of those objects are working in the same way. They're trying to take the actual state 
of the object in the cluster that's running and move it towards the desired state that you want. So that concept of desired state, really important in Kubernetes. So uh, let's talk about an example here. So if I, if I have a container and I want it just to run on a Kubernetes uh, system, I can just say kubectl run image. And from that verb, you should see that I'm telling it what I want it to do or how I want it to do it. I want you to run it. But what if I had multiple containers that I wanted those to work together? So <clears throat> let's say I need to have one run before the other. How am I going to do that here? Well, I could write a shell script that does a kubectl run. Uh, the first one waits for that one to run and run determination and then do the second kubectl run. But that's that imperative behavior that we're trying to change with Kubernetes. GitOps, and that's that desired state concept. Instead, I just want to tell it, I need this running. Please go out and make it happen, right? So <clears throat> in this example, I'm telling it to do the run. There's a better way to do it with Kubernetes, and that's something called the deployment. So in a deployment, you're going to package up your definition of your pod in, in a specification inside the deployment. So now I've just changed the behavior of what I want to say is, hey, I need this deployment and I want to apply it. Notice the different verb there, apply it to my Kubernetes cluster. So the whole definition of what I want for that pod or those pods with the example, the initialization pod is comprised inside that template specification. Why is that important? Well, if my pod fails, Kubernetes knows how to go and get the an exact replica of it, right? So remember I talked about immutable resources and making sure I can always get back to version ones. The deployment has that specification inside of it. So if my pod fails, Kubernetes is able to create another one, right? So this is all that declarative and desired state that is so important here. So uh, my example before, if I had to do some setup work and then I needed to run my actual uh, pod, I could de define all of that together inside of Kubernetes. And that declarative principles, uh, those primitives are gonna help take you away from the having to de define the how and you let Kubernetes take care of the how it makes that happen. So of course this applies to everything in Kubernetes. So you can define a job, you can define a cron job. Uh, if you had stateful applications where you know the, the storage that you're using inside of your application is is important to that particular instance you can have something called a stateful application and what that'll do is when kubernetes rebuilds it based on the template spec it tries to put it all back together uh, the way it knows so to attach the right storage to the right pod and deal with it so all of this boils down into those control loops uh, that uh, are the foundational piece of Kubernetes itself. So everything you're going to deal with are control loops. You're going to define declarative state, and you're going to let the platform make things run uh, on your behalf when you build these distributed applications. So kind of in summary of Kubernetes, and again, I was going to talk about the operation model of Kubernetes itself, is you declare that desired state, you apply it to your Kubernetes environment, control loops kick in, uh, for the primitives and any custom resources that you've defined. And Kubernetes itself is responsible for driving from actual state to the desired state that you declared in your environment. So uh, one thing I forgot to mention before when you talk about the declared state and that is uh, if, if we go back to my ex existing example where I had an initial pod that I need to run before my actual pod, if I'm doing that imperatively where I tell it to run and then I tell it to run the second one, I can do that, but I'd have to adopt something like item potency, right? To where, well, what if it fails in between? How do I know I can safely run the first one again and deal with all of that? Well, Kubernetes, is, that declarative state is really helping you with that aspect of your environment. So let's talk about now sh shifting gears, GitOps. How does that apply in the GitOps space? So uh, again, if you go back to my Tetris example, and I'm sorry, I, I, I hope it makes sense when I'm talking about the te Tetris levels and how they, and they come down. But if you have those, that desired state, so my application consists of two pods, uh, four services, I need to expose on this port, I need this networking, uh, I need you know, security and secrets. Uh, I wanna put all of that as a single artifact so that I can get back to it again into Git. So with GitOps, that would be a Git commit, right? If you think about source code and writing source code, you make a bunch of changes together, you group them together and you create a commit in your repository and you move forward. The nice piece of that is I can revert that commit and everything will go back to how it was prior to that commit. Same concept applies here. So as you're uh, 
revising and mod modifying your applications as you move forward, you want to make sure that you are able to go back to anything for failure cases uh, inside of your environment. And that's where that git commit concept uh, will help you there. But it turns out since we're talking about YAML files, they're text files, uh, they work really well inside of a, a git system. So, But of course, uh, GitOps is more than just, uh, you know, creating commits inside of Git. So there's <clears throat> there's an open GitOps group. So you've heard a lot of GitOps probably from Weaveworks, uh, but there's really an open group that defines uh, what GitOps is. So I hope you'll see that there's kind of a parallel between Kubernetes itself is this uh, open software system uh, that's managed by a group of people in the, in the uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, GitOps has this uh, GitOps working group here that's in opengitops.dev, and they uh, have pulled together a bunch of companies uh, that are focused on the same principles of GitOps. So they define these principles of if you're going to use a GitOps system, it needs to have these things. It needs to be declarative. So I've talked a lot about being declarative, but you want to define the what, not the how. It needs to be version and immutable. So if you are not using Git, you need a versioned file system, or you need to version your files, you need to do something. Uh, but I need to be able to always get back to that. And it needs to be immutable. Once I say something is version 1.1, for example, it needs to always mean that same thing. Uh, we need those changes pulled in automatically into our environment. And in this case, our environment is Kubernetes. So I need to be declarative what I want. I need to always be able to get back to an exact version of that. I need those pulled automatically into my cluster. And then on top of that, I need to be able to con continuously be reconciling, you know, my actual or desired state from the actual state. So you can see that that is constantly working to keep it at that level. And that's another change from that imperative, you know, run it once, uh, you know, run an init container and then run a second container is how do I know the second container is running? How do I know I need to run init again? Well, you want to capture all of that in that declarative environment. So again, declarative version and immutable pulled automatically and continuously reconciled in your system. So why does this benefit you uh, as a business? So you're going to have greater visibility into what's happening. So uh, with the advent of a lot of monitoring tools, uh, they've made it really easy to expose metrics about what your system is doing and how it's behaving. Uh, so your GitOps tooling should also provide those types of metrics. So having those metrics available in your GitOps and cluster environment uh, is really nice. Trying to expose those through a regular continuous delivery system uh, can be a little more problematic than saying, well, my metrics live with my clusters, right? As far as their GitOps aspect. Improve security. By this, I mean we flip the model a bit. So if you're thinking of traditional continuous delivery, uh, you may say, well, deploy to that cluster and deploy to that cluster and deploy to that cluster. Uh, in order to do those deploys, you need to have a secret. You need to have a key to talk to them. This flips the model into more of a pull-based model. So now the cluster itself is watching and pulling in things. And it has the permissions model of uh, the GitOps that you give it uh, to apply workloads to the cluster. So you can see that model flips a little bit on its head. Uh, you're not having either a shared secret that's used on multiple clusters or worried about that because everything's localized into this one cluster. Uh, what does that do? It gives you this access log so I can go to the cluster and see when it pulled things, when it applied things, what did it do? And of course that breeds more standardization and of course auditability, so which is one of the key aspects that you want to get there. So how is this benefiting developers? So. Uh, when you're running GitOps, and we're going to go through the kind example uh, here in a minute that David is going to cover, walk us through. Uh, as a developer, I can run a kind cluster on my local desktop, point it at my Git repository, and I know all my workloads automatically get deployed into it via Git. Uh, you might say, uh, and it's a valid thing to say, well, I don't want to push to Git every time. But uh, one thing that I've done, and maybe you've seen this before in the past, is uh, how many times have you been troubleshooting something and you make, you know, writ rapid changes into your environment, you get it working and you think everything's good, but you forgot about all those steps that happen. And you might say, well, Mark, you can go to your shell and get a history and see all of those steps. Unfortunately, some of that history is gonna be VI this file, VI that file, et cetera, right? I don't know what I did inside that file. Again, this is where GitOps helps you in that, well, if I were using GitOps and creating commits in there, and I'm not saying you would do this for troubleshooting a file system or an error in your system, but 
if I had that whole history, I would know exactly what IVI because I would have the contents of the file, the changes to what again, and I could go back and audit it and know how did I fix that problem in the past. So uh, that's going to reduce the, the workload and the knowledge that the developer needs in order to apply workloads to a cluster. And uh, uh, back to the security thing, you don't need to give out those credentials for everybody to have. So if you had a shared development environment, uh, you don't need to give everybody the keys to the cluster if the cluster itself is pulling its workloads in. So as a platform team, uh, you can build up a, you know, a set of workloads that you want running there and you can be in charge of that. Uh, and again, since you control the repository of where that stuff's coming in, nobody else needs those permissions. Again, back to the permissions uh, there in there, you can easily roll back changes uh, as a platform team. So let's say you deployed a new version of uh, uh, Prometheus, for example, and there was problems with it. Uh, you can roll that back as a platform team and you can do it uh, because it's all in Git. Now you can make those changes and see it. And of course, we're gonna go back to, I can audit it. I have a common way to do that on all those different systems. So it's easier to track changes and it provides that whole layer of standardization for delivery in there. So at a high level, what is GitOps? And these should sound pretty similar, right? Declarative configuration, uh, it's version control, the mutable artifacts, and it's a single source of truth. So um, those three bullets sort of mirror what Kubernetes said before, but GitOps is a little bit more than just a single source of truth and, and the declarative configuration. It's back to those principles, automated delivery of declarative resources. Uh, the agents are running in the cluster so that they're reconciling those differences automatically. And it's that closed loop that we're looking for in GitOps itself. So just a little uh, pictures here. So if, uh, if I'm a developer, I'm going to write YAML files, which is the Kubernetes uh, language for defining objects. I'm going to check that into Git. It's version controlled. I'm going to have GitOps running in my cluster. It's going to see those changes. It's going to pull those in via these software agents, and it's going to constantly reconcile that cluster to make sure it matches the desired state that you checked into Git and that your cluster has. So if we want to look at a traditional CI CD system, you have your Kubernetes cluster and the API server that you're going to talk to. Um, you have a couple developers. They're writing some code. They're checking that into Git. Uh, that is now picked up by a CI system, so a continuous integration system that will be building that into a Docker container that goes into a registry. And of course, this is a nice iterative process here. Now, when I go to deploy that in a traditional CI CD system, not a GitOps system, now I've added kubectl into potentially into my CD system. I'm going to need a key in order to talk to the API server, right, so that I can then uh, deploy my workloads and get my artifacts out. So that's kind of a traditional CI CD system and how it differs from a GitOps system. So in summary, uh, the GitOps uh, is going to be a Git-centric way of implementing that continuous delivery. Uh, the benefits increase productivity, the developer experience. Uh, security is really a big one and auditing and stability are all uh, big aspects that I use for it uh, and consistency and standardization are helpful. Talk about those four principles. Uh, again, you can go to Open GitOps uh, and see this, uh, but there it's declarative, version controlled, and immutable, automatically uh, pulled or automatically yeah rec there and continuously reconciled. So all that's there. So GitOps helps you overcome that tight coupling of CI to CD because when it comes time to deploy your workloads, let the let the system itself pull the workloads in. Uh, and again, you get all the benefits of GitOps in that instance. So that's it for my portion of today's talk. Um, if there are any questions, I can try and answer some of those yes. or we can move ahead. We have questions. Ah. Um, yes. So let's just start chronologically. Um, yeah, for this one, I decided not to interrupt you because uh, I knew you were kind of getting toward the end. So first question. Um, is it typically one GitOps controller per Git repo or the same controller can sync multiple repos? Thanks for that question. That's a that's a great question. So when we talk about a controller, <clears throat> remember it's managing the, the object life cycles. Each uh, repository or workload that you're syncing from Git is gonna be a separate instance of that. 
and you're going to have that one controller that's able to reconcile all of those instances there. It turns out that that Flux, which is I didn't talk a lot about, but it's the toolkit that underpins Beep GitOps that we're talking about here. It has many controllers in there, and you're going to use those pieces loosely coupled in order to facilitate that. But what happens is you have that one controller that manages all of those instances of your uh, workloads that you're deploying from different clusters, from different uh, Git repos, sorry. Awesome. Um, and then one question was, can I see a live demo of this? And I said, not only will you see a live demo, you'll be doing it yourself in just minutes. So we're excited to um, jump into that next after we finish our questions. It's also fun to see people find friends in our chat and saying hello, it's very sweet. Um, next one, uh, is GitOps replacing CD in the Kubernetes environment? Um, I mean, Flux is Flux CD. It, it is Flux CD. And I think uh, for all of the primitive workloads and everything that's running inside of your cluster, yes. But there may be other pieces that you have to set up externally. So those could remain inside of your CD. That doesn't mean you couldn't write operators that are driven by the definition that's inside your repository. But <clears throat> I think ultimately you would want to use you know, the CD would be replaced by GitOps inside of each of your clusters. Yeah, and we should emphasize here a given, but for people who are new, you know, for CI CD, a common question we get is, you know, but I already invested a lot of time and money in my CI system. Does this mean I have to change everything? And the answer is always no, you can work with what you have right. already. This is not about tearing everything out. This is complementary as part of CI CD. So happy to answer more details in that if it, people have questions in, in our Slack channel later. Um, in fact, uh, is there a preferred Git system? I would say no, we support many, right? Yeah, I, I think it's a personal preference. Yeah. Thing. So, so um, yeah, they're all they're all good, and we support many. Yes, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, um, others. Those, yeah, I think the top questions we have there uh, all supported. Um, mm -hmm. All right, should there be an admin cluster where the Flux component runs, and then making the calls to the prod cluster, or are customers running the Flux component within the same cluster that it is managing? Great question. Thanks. This is a really good question, and uh, it turns out we support both. Uh, instances so you can use flux and run uh, the flux uh, controllers in one cluster and have those apply to the other cluster but some of the things that you need to keep in mind is uh, if if i don't have connectivity to the other clusters that can be problematic uh, if if uh, if if somebody compromises your one cluster that's pushing into all of the other clusters that can be that can be problematic because you need to have there need to be keys in order to talk to the remote cluster. So I think it really depends on how you want to set it up, but we have seen it set up in exactly, you know, both of those ways. Yeah, we tend to we tend to do it the other way to where we want the clusters to kind of self-manage their own workloads uh, so that the, the, the permissions and keys and things like that live there and we don't have to have constant connection. I think you're on mute, Tamo. Sorry, I muted myself. I <laughs> had water go down the wrong tube. Um, so thanks for your questions. If any others come up, please go ahead and continue to chat. Mark will be in the background answering them. Um, but I see that David has joined and we have the question of let's see this in action. So why don't we uh, jump into into that? Um, so this next portion, um, please have your laptops ready. Um, come and join with us. Uh, we are here to troubleshoot. We are patient. We are happy to wait. Um, Stacy will put in a link to the getting started instructions in the chat so that you can have that open. Um, so there'll be two parts. I will do, and I'll introduce David here, who is uh, here, our PM, who will walk you through the steps. Um, but before that, I'll have a brief, like, three-minute bit where um, I'm going to show you the turkey dinner, right? So like keep the keep the vision in mind of why you're here, like the what benefits you'll have after you go through these go through these steps so that as we're going through the steps, which fortunately aren't that many, you know, you're not forgetting like, wait, why am I doing these steps again? <laughs> why am I here? What, what, what am I trying to get out of this? So um, I will share my screen and just have a quick um, and vision that will also summarize in some ways these benefits that um, am I supposed to click? Sorry, sometimes I forget. Oops. 
Okay, everyone can see that. Um, okay, great. Um, so just so you um, are reminded of yeah, all these benefits uh, from GitOps, and you've learned that it's a nice evolution of Kubernetes um, so that you can focus on the end goal. Um, all right, so as I mentioned at the beginning, or some of you joined later, um, we are all coming from a company called Weaveworks, and really we run these workshops because we are committed to having you have a very successful journey um, through whatever part you are in building your cloud native strategy. Uh, we are really here to help you transition to cloud native, um, depend, regardless of whatever stage you are. So as you'll see, um, we'll be using um, open source um, projects here through the workshop um, and we have sort of like a, a learning tool on top of that um, that's called weave GitOps that will get you up and running very quickly so you'll be happy by the end of this workshop you will actually be not learning about GitOps but doing it um, and it really um, we've designed it with this commitment that you know it supports any Kubernetes so whether it's the open source or our products um, you know on-prem or in the cloud um, we have designed this so that you know hopefully it supports um, any version of Kubernetes that, that you need. Um, and then not only did we coin the term GitOps, but we really have been leading the way here with the vision and the actual pro products and projects that we have out there. So please give us tons of feedback on how um, this experience is for you because we're um, very dedicated to improving this. So Mark talked about a lot of things. And so let me just, um, you know, resummarize that, um, you know, hopefully you've come here because you've learned a little bit about the benefits of GitOps on a technical level, but we also want to remind, you know, the benefits on a business level. Um, Stacy here has run many GitOps Days events and uh, we'll send you links in case you've missed any of them. We have these fantastic online events of many, many people talking about, you know, their journey through GitOps and there are a lot of people who are quite advanced. Um, and it's not just the benefits on the technical level, but um, you know, the DORA metrics have shown that companies that have the best velocity um, measure very highly on other levels, like, you know, faster time to IPO and revenue growth and et cetera. So these are all very much connected to um, your business goals as well. So high velocity means also, you know, there's easier troubleshooting, uh, lower failed deploys. Um, you have a much more reliable um, uh, system. So when you make changes to production, you can have that uh, done with, uh, you know, both emotional security and technical security. Um, and if anything goes wrong, right, you have a lower mean time to recovery. So we really are here to de dedicate it to making sure that you have those benefits. <clears throat> so uh, the open source flux that we talked about, as well as this weave GitOps um, on which you'll be uh, using this, it's free and open source uh, tool to get you started really quickly. Um, just so you know, um, as you've seen our dedication, it is Kubernetes native and Flux native. So um, it will be an opinionated way to do Flux so that you can get started really quickly. Um, but ultimately, you know, it is built on all the capabilities that um, you will, if you're just getting started, you will learn more and more um, about um, the Flux capabilities and why it's in the CNCF as such a powerful tool and why I should mention, um, we also had a recent GitOps Days event where companies showed why they have chosen Flux as their tool to deliver GitOps to their customers, right? So they are not just end users of Flux, but they are relying on it to deliver GitOps to their customers. And those companies are companies like Microsoft, Amazon, VMware, Red Hat, uh, D2IQ, which are the Mesosphere people. So um, hopefully if you're wondering, what is this about this open source tool? Like these are the types of companies um, that are trusting Flux to deliver GitOps um, to their end users. Uh, and if you're interested in actual end users, um, just go to fluxcd.io, which is our um, open source site where there are plenty of adopters um, adding their names. And uh, actually, I just heard that SAP just added their name as end user uh, to Flux. So lots of companies, big and small. So it's a very exciting time. Uh, so again, we want to reiterate, we want to make sure that, you know, you're benefiting from GitOps um, and in an overall way, like total, um, um, the, the, the total product production experience, you know, your deployments, your CI systems, your workflows, your observability, these are all the things that we're offering um, with our projects and products. So 
I know it can sound scary. I know Mark shared the four principles of GitOps. Um, and if you see any of our speakers from the past, their advice is always, you know, take small steps, um, decide which of the four principles you can get started with. There are many companies that are quite advanced in their GitOps journey, and they're probably fully doing three out of the four um, core principles, um, but they're, they're on their way. It's a process. And so, you know, this GitOps maturity model is something that we are dedicated to. You might be at the level now where you're just thinking about single apps, but in the future, as you get to the top of this pyramid, you know, you're thinking about multi-tenancy and policy and complex deployment management, which are all things that um, Flux and our other offerings will help you with. Um, so we are here to help you on that journey. And um, so please reach out to us uh, anywhere on Slack or by email, we are dedicated to your success. Uh, and again, to reiterate, yes, developer velocity, GitOps automation, these are all part of the entire um, software lifecycle through which we have various solutions to help you. Um, so with that, I will stop sharing and hopefully just keep that in mind as we go through the steps with David and um, check out the links that Stacy shared. Um, where we'll go through the prerequisites. If you haven't done the prerequisites, you just showed up, no problem. We will help you through that. And then we'll help you through the steps so that you can actually say by the end of this, I did GitOps. <laughs> so David, take it away. Hi, good Hello. evening, good morning, depending where you are, everybody. Um, so what we're gonna do today is the getting started guide of the so GitOps my, core. My... And you can see now my, my screen, we're gonna do everything together. I have set up two, two watchers. We will need, um, or I will need to demonstrate some functionality later. And we need basically our console. And now we are going to the getting started guide. Um, I think the link is provided in the chat. And what we need is for this guide that everybody has a GitHub account, kubecut it installed, and we're gonna use a kind cluster, but you're free to use whatever cluster you want. It's not if you have already mini cube running or you have a EKS cluster running, it will work with every cluster. So it doesn't really matter. But yeah. if you follow this getting started, we want to use kind. Yeah, but so, so just to pause there. So um, I know that some people who've joined our workshops in the past do not have a GitHub account. Even, so even um, it just takes a few minutes. We're happy to wait for you to do that. Secondly, uh, we also have the question, you know, what does this work with? Um, I think you can still do the workshop if you're using, for example, GitLab. Um, I personally haven't had someone in the workshop using Bitbucket, but okay. Technically, it would work yeah. as well, correct? I, I think I'm um, Bitbucket, I'm not too sure, but oh. GitLab for sure. Okay. So uh, GitLab should for definitely right. work. Um, so please uh, raise your hand or let us know in the chat if you need a few minutes to uh, create an account. And we are happy to um, make sure that that gets set up so you can follow along. And uh, please don't be shy. Um, alternatively, also, if anybody hasn't done the cube cuddle, uh, David, would you mind clicking on the instructions for the cube cuddle install installation? Um, so yes, for Linux, Mac, and Windows, um, I think people have done that before as well, and it takes maybe just a few minutes, not too long. Uh, and then yes. the last, yes, and the last one as well is kind, which quite frequently. There are people who have not used kind yet, but um, was pretty quick. I think the only time we yeah, had a little bit of a snag was one person who had not um, had Docker installed, but that one too, I think that person caught up. So any and all so of these- You need actually Docker for kind. So if you're yes. using kind, you need Docker. Exactly. So yeah. one person had to get Docker installed, but even that was not too bad. Um, there was a question. Um, I have an EKS environment. Um, does it, someone using EKS need to use kind or can they move forward? Great question, by the way. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it works as well on an EKS cluster. I, All what you need is your cube config. You need basically cube cutted access to it, but so there's no reason why it should work with an EKS cluster. So. Okay, so they don't need kind. Okay, fantastic. Thanks for asking. Um, yes, anyone else like say would the same go for um, if anybody's using Azure AKS? Or is that a little different? Yes. No, okay. no, I'm not that I aware of. It should all work. Okay, excellent. As right. long as, um, yeah, I, I, I think the latest Flux release support, you need at least Kubernetes 1.18, I think. This is the only requisite, yeah. I think. It's okay, really great. predetermined by um, the Kubernetes version. All right. Um, okay, please I, raise I, your I hand or already, message to us. <laughs> you can message to us privately if you feel shy. But we want to make sure that um, you can follow along. So if anybody needs to complete any of these three steps, um, let us know. Um, okay, and Mark is sharing. We've had people in the past have success with K3. So if anybody's using K3, you can do that as well. Oh, sorry. Oh, I see someone had actually asked that question. I missed that. I'm going to try with my K3S. Um, yeah, so it should work. All right, great. It's great to see people engaging and um, getting the progress started. Okay, we have one hand that's up, so maybe we need a few minutes. Um, while we're waiting, um, we can just explain a little bit what we'll be going through. So we'll be installing a CLI. You'll be creating your repos, um, which is a good opportunity for me to share. So um, with many of you who might be here because you heard about Flux, um, you know, one great thing about Flux is that it is so unopinionated. It is so um, freeing and you can do so many things. And that's why I think we have these great end users as well as, as I mentioned, um, the, um, um, sorry, what are you, integrators who, um, you know, are leveraging Flux to, to provide GitOps uh, for their own end users. Um, that said, that flexibility has often led to people in the beginning maybe getting a little bit of decision fatigue, especially around repo structure, uh, because they're like, oh, wow, it's almost too wide open that I feel like I need to spend six weeks researching and doing my homework and, you know, looking at my needs. Um, so that's why uh, we're using this Weave GitOps as a teaching tool so that you get your repo and your repo structure up and running right away. And then moving forward, you'll continue to learn and then hopefully you'll give us feedback on whether, yes, this is exactly what works for us, it's fantastic, or this is working well, but there are a few um, changes that we need for our needs, or, well, now we've become fairly advanced users and we realize like we need something completely different. So uh, we would love to hear your thoughts on that. So please let us know. But this way, like, like I said, by the end of this workshop, you at least have something um, that uh, is opinionated and that you can then start from that starting point. Um, I've often felt like it's easier for people to know what they don't like <laughs> versus, uh, um, you know, figure out what works for you. So I really, really hope that this is a good teaching tool for you. So let us know. Um, I also noticed there's a few questions and Mark is answering in the Q&A. Um, and so on the note of the repos, after we go through the steps, um, Mark will jump back in and kind of explain a little bit about the logic behind um, how we chose this particular repo structure as a starting point. So hopefully that will be helpful for you as well. Um, and then we'll have some remaining steps. So hopefully um, that's a helpful overview. Oh, and then I should remind you, after we've done everything, we'll also um, either give demos or explain a little bit about other things that might be valuable for you for GitOps, like disaster recovery, using Helm charts, um, other things that you know, you'll know you hopefully be able to do as follow-up steps after this getting started. Um, okay, so with that, uh, please raise your hand or shout in the chat if you still need a minute or two. We are very, very happy to help. We have plenty of time. Okay, if not, David will uh, continue on. Okay, so thanks, Tom. Um, so now the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna install the CLI tool and what you need to do is copy and paste this command. 
in your console. I already have it installed, so I'm not gonna gonna to do it. But basically, um, if you, this this is your CLI tool, you need to copy and paste it, and then you need to execute it, and it will probably ask you for your password. And there you go. I'm not gonna do this. Um, so I have it already installed. So, but you can, if you have it already installed, you can check the version. So I'm on the version we're gonna demo today, which is part of this getting started guide. A new version is coming up, which is already advertised here, but this is not the version we are gonna to use today in this getting started guide. So that is the first thing we're gonna do. We need as well, um, a Git repo. And the first thing we need to do is setting up a config repo. I have done as well already this. So in this guide, we're gonna use um, a repo, which is called GitOps config. You can call this repo, whatever you want. Um, it doesn't really matter. The only important thing is if you, if you start to create a new repo and then I can show you this, it doesn't really matter how you do this, but you click new, you give it a name, my new repo. What you need to take care of that you initialize the repo um, so that a branch exists. If we, we don't initialize it, there will be no branch and it will be hard to make for GitOps basically or our engine to make a pull request. So this will basically, for example, if we click here, we add a readme file, this will directly initialize the repo and there will be basically main as the default branch, which is good. So this is the first step we need to do. You need to create a repo. I have already done this, so we don't need to do this. And right, as- let's, uh, let's take yes, one please. step here. Uh, Mark is sharing. Oh, yes, I think important. Um, so we're sharing the docs here and Mark brought up a good point in terms of which version of the docs that we're showing. So if you look at the top right there, there it says 0 0.6.2. Um, that's the latest greatest. So just make sure I mean, I think I think if you're going brand new to the doc site and you've never been before, I think it defaults to the latest. Are we correct? Yes, yes that's that. correct. But we've had people before where they were on an older version and it would cause yes. them a little bit of confusion. So yes, um, just, it's subtle, but I just wanted to call it out. Very important. Yes. Um, okay. So, <clears throat> so just a moment here. So we just went through the stop of installing the CLI um, and then creating the repo. I know that David went through quite a few steps. So hopefully you were able to watch it and now you're able to do it. Um, Please raise your hand if you are still a few steps back or um, hit any snags. I was also asking, oh, okay, I see a hand. Thank you, I really, really appreciate that. Um, if you just need time, then we will wait. If you got caught on a snag, let us know in the chat. Um, also, um, I was asking if, um, yeah, what kind of systems people are using, Linux, OS X, or Windows. I saw one person respond Linux. Um, just good to know, like, if there's any particular types of um, operating systems that maybe, you know, we've missed something in the docs or we've missed potential bugs. Um, WSL, I'm ignorant. What is that? Uh, that's Windows subsystem for Linux. Oh, Hopefully Windows. you're running version two of that because version two is uh, much better and I think it actually supports Docker. There oh. were issues with Docker ah. in uh, WSL one. Cool, I see. And the answer is yes. All right, supporting Docker. So good, good to know. Um, also maybe something, oh, Chrome. Uh, Chrome. Chrome OS. Oh, Chrome OS. Work. Chrome OS might not work? Uh-oh. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure if that's just a uh, uh, one of those uh, computers that's just a effectively just a browser that runs everything in the in the Chrome OS. I don't know. Okay. We've never used it before. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Let us know if you hit Chromebook. any snags. Chrome. That's yeah. The, the Chrome. Remember back in the days when they were like, "Look under your chair. There's a Chromebook <laughs> at those events." Um, Cool, thanks for sharing that. I'm glad I asked. Uh, don't ask every time. So 
Um, okay, so we did the prerequisites. If anybody has snags on the prerequisites, don't be shy. People have in the past. We definitely want to know. Um, and then installing the CLI. Um, I believe, David, you mostly just uh, went through what was here. There is a link to more on the installation page, but I believe for this workshop, we haven't had to go through further steps, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then creating the repos. Um, yeah, hopefully you saw uh, that this is a pretty quick process um, that we're going through. And um, as I said, we'll explain later a little bit more of the logic behind that. So, okay, so we have created the uh, config repo, and now we're going through the very important step of forking. Yes, so the config repo will only store basically our configuration and it will not be the app itself we're going to deploy. It will basically point to, to the app repo. So what we're going to do, we want to deploy the, the pod info app. So pod info app is this beautiful app that Stefan Prodan wrote. And this is a great example app. And basically in this repo, you can find the deployment manifest. So it split it up and in front end and back end. And if we go to front end, you can see it contains basically the Kubernetes manifests we need to deploy this app. Mm -hmm. So these are the instructions we want to get ops. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna basically uh, first fork this repo because we want to execute pull requests on it. And we're gonna fork it to, to your personal account or whatever account you want. And once this is done, we're gonna clone this repo. And for this, we're gonna copy this path. Um, we're gonna, I, I'm not even sure if we need to clone it. I'm gonna do it anyway. And we're gonna clone it to our local machine. And that's basically it. So now, now we are ready to go to for the next step. Which is basically we need to bring up our cluster. And to initialize this, if you use kind, not everybody needs to do this. So I'm going to start this now because this takes a moment. Is um, kind create cluster. And this will bring up our, our cluster. This takes a moment. And yes, so give it a moment. Need to do this if you're using EKS or whatever and you already have a cluster. So while we're waiting, um, I was thinking about how often when, um, as to remind people, right, we are um, helping you set up Flux, the open source project in the CNCF, um, which also has its own um, bootstrapping, if anybody wants to do that path. Um, and one of the things we talk about is even from step zero, when you're setting these up, you're already doing GitOps, right? You're doing it in, um, in, in, um, from a particular methodology. Um, so Davi, not to put you on the spot, but um, is that also happening here um, through this Weave GitOps tool? Is it also kind of using a GitOps yes. methodology? So now, now we are coming to, to the critical point, right? Now our cluster is up and running and we're gonna initialize basically our, our first thing and we're gonna install VF GitOps on the cluster and we're gonna point to the config repo we want to use. Exactly. So this is basically we're gonna now hook it up with, with our source and the source is our GitOps repo. 
And this is the number, step number four is the critical command. You need to make sure that this here is replaced by your username. And if you have given the user a different, different repo uh, name, for example, you haven't used GitOps config, then need to make sure that this path is correct, right? So um, if we copy this command and paste it for me, I have created my username in GitHub is David Stauffer. And the repo is GitOps config. So I can execute this command. And now we can see what, what is going to happen. And what you should see on the right hand side is the flux controllers are coming up. So this is basically watching in my kind cluster the namespace of Vigo system. And you can see that we go system meaning we have GitOps system. And here you can see that our, our flux controllers are coming up, which are one Helm controller. Um, then we have the image automation controller, which is very exciting. It allows you to basically just roll out a new image and flux will pick it up and deploy this new image. We have the customized controller that we need very much, um, the source controller as well. And which is as well quite exciting. We have a notification controller. We don't want to talk in detail about this today, but it allows you based on events to, to push out notifications to, to your favorite tools like Slack or whatever. So this will take a moment because it will, all these pods need to be up and ready before we, we will have finished up the installation. So let us know if you have problems with this critical step. Excellent, perfect timing because um, someone was in the chat just double checking about if they're using EKS, whether they can um, just get started with the main steps. And the answer is yes. So if you are already using EKS, you can bypass the re prerequisites um, or at least in terms of kind, you, you do not have to um, set up kind on EKS. You just will use EKS as your um, cluster for this exercise. Um, and then there's another question. Uh, did we have to clone the repo locally first? If GitOps is deploying from GitHub, um, sorry, from the GitHub repo, or just both need to be done? So thanks for that question. I think it was just me out of, um, normally if you change something, you do it locally. So this was probably just my, um, uh, yeah, yeah in, my in pattern. The, in, in the you past, don't need to do it. Yeah, and in the past we had a simplification that allowed you to say, well, if I already have a copy of the repository here, just use that. So basically we interrogate that local clone in order to set some of the parameters if you're using the CLI, but you, don't, you can pass those as the uh, dash dash URL parameter instead. Okay, so the answer is you don't have to. That's just what uh, David was doing for this demo. Okay. Yep. So there... we're almost there. Okay, yes. just to be sure. So there's locally or not, or are there other um, ways of doing it for us to detail so people know? Is that mostly it? I would say that's mostly it. Um, cool. Yeah. Okay. So while we're working on this uh, verifying installation, uh, please let us know. Uh, raise your hands. Throw us a question in the chat if you are stuck in any way. Uh, but it looks like David's process has completed. So I'll hand it back to you. Yes. So we still need to authenticate. So we need to go to this URL. You could have set up a GitHub to token before. I don't think I did this. Um, so we support as well that you off in the moment. So we're gonna do this device registration. We need for this to visit the URL and we're gonna copy the, this code. And we're gonna grant access to our tool to authenticate with GitHub. And now you can see that it's gonna push some changes. And if we go now to, to our repo, 
which I just created, which, what was the name, GitOps config. Um, now you can see a folder appeared like magic, which is basically 19 seconds ago. And this is our config folder, which will contain our whole Git up, GitOps automation and runtime configuration. Um, Mark, do you want to extend here on the directory structure or do, do we go a bit further? Um, usually we go a little bit further and we add the application okay. because it uh, augments that directory structure and then I can explain all the different pieces. Yes, let's do this. All right, so the next thing is we're going to do now something useful with this and we're going to basically deploy an app, right? This is what we really care about. So let's let's run the GitOps UI and we have this command GitOps UI run. And this lets us run the UI locally. And here we are. And now we can add an application and we're going to give it a name, for example, put in for deploy. So the source repo URL is in this case, this is my, my source repo URL and my config repo URL is this one. You need to make sure that this matches your configuration. And this is basically it. If you select this flag auto merge, it will not just, it will basically directly commit and merge it instead of creating a pull request. We are gonna be good citizens. We're gonna create a pull request. So if I now submit this, it detected that we want to we are want to talk to GitHub. So we're gonna authenticate again with GitHub with this device log inflow. And we're gonna authorize it again, our UI so that it can speak to GitHub. And now if we click now submit. It should create a pull request. So now we have directly a link to this pull request we created. And look what it did. It created on our config repo a pull request. And if we open now this pull request, this is what wants to change. It wants to, to add, add this. Um, app.yaml, which is the, the specification of um, basically our application, the object that defines this. It wants to add this customization and yeah, some other automation rules. For example, here is that the, the interval, how often it will look um, to, to update it. And this is what we're gonna merge. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna merge this pull request. And now you will see in the other watcher I have here, how in a few seconds, this app will start to come up. If everything goes well. Okay. Uh, while we're pausing here, um, just a reminder, um, unless you're being shy, uh, please post your questions to everyone um, because I'm noticing some people are posting questions directly to us and then Mark is answering to everyone. So I think people are wondering, I see an answer, but I'm not sure what the actual question was. Uh, so we, we had a question saying, you know, uh, in the previous step, so where, where do I put the code? And uh, Mark Emice was explaining that the code goes into the form uh, or the URL that is printed just below the code. Um, so hopefully we answer that question and also uh, made that uh, context clear for the re remaining people. Uh, and yes, we do get the question, uh, is this all recorded? Yes, it is. Um, hopefully you can still complete this with us. Uh, you know, we, we want to make sure people can can complete it. But if um, if anybody does have to leave, yes, you will get the remaining recording. Or if you'd like to share it with anybody, um, we, we do post these all on YouTube afterwards, so they're not gated or anything. Um, but yes, uh, we'll email you with a follow-up with the recording as well as the slack link that stacy also put in here so you know we definitely want to make sure everybody is able to complete this and enjoy the benefits of GitOps and uh, move on to the next steps of added benefits so please uh, let us know 
Um, so we have a question. Uh, is it recommended to use the SSH version of the repo URL as opposed to the HTTPS version? When I click submit in the UI, I get an error stating that it failed to clone my repo, but it is trying to use the SSH URL instead of the HTTPS one that I configured in the environment. Great question, Bobby. Um, yeah, I'm Mark. Can you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so we have a a couple of areas in the code base where uh, we're trying to promote things to SSH. And so, uh, or, or sorry, from HTTPS to SSH. So right now you're best uh, if you can use SSH for access to your repo, that'll, be, that'll give you the best success yet. And, and it, right now, and we're working on uh, fixing a couple of reasons the code that have that limitation. So what I'm showing you here is, is where you can access it through the UI and you can see your, your objects in Kubernetes coming up and being alive in, in this graph representation. So, and now you can see everything is up. You can see um, basically what, what were the latest pull requests or commits on, on this repo. So it gives you some, some insights what's really going on. And you have a button to, to basically poke and, and sync the app. And as well, if I look here, I can see basically in this CLI tool here um, that my, my both pods are up and running. So let us know if you made it that far, because if you made it that far, you we have done the onboarding of an app and we can start with some more exciting stuff. Cool. Um, in fact, uh, one person is asking, um, can we do those deployments with Helm charts? And the answer is yes. Um, in fact, we'll be talking a little bit more um about that at the end of um this workshop uh or if there are some moments where we need to pause we might uh, move in there um also someone's saying i'm using gcp and i'm having issues verifying my GitOps version i get the following error GitOps command not found so would that mean the installation of so the, the error is um command not found for GitOps. When using GCP, does that mean so, that we've GitOps installation didn't? That's what, that's what it means. It's either not in the path, uh, it didn't go into the correct path. Um, so it, it, take a look at where you installed that. Yeah. Thanks. And it's so great to see uh, attendees helping each other. So thanks for answering the other question. Yeah, check your path and variable. So hopefully that will help. Um, so, uh, David, uh, you're saying we completed the overall steps, so maybe we can do, uh, um, before we move on to, as you say, more exciting things, maybe you can kind of do an overview of what we just did. So we started with some prerequisites. Yes, we, we, we started with some prerequisites. We have set up our config repo and we have set up a app repo. Why do we care about two different repos? Because if you think about it, your organization the structure will often be that you have one team that really handles this pod info deploy app and they will apply changes to this repository. And then you have a platform team which manages uh, the, your Kubernetes platform, which will really take care of what's going on on the cluster itself, who will be more, con more concerned about your GitOps config repo. And, and this is basically why we use different repos for different tasks because it matches a bit your organization and structure. Um, there's no hard need to use it like this. You could use it as well in a different way. But I think it's a good moment, Mark, right? To talk a bit about the directory structure. Sure, sure. Uh, so. Do you mind if I share? Yes, uh, and one yes. pause before we do that because we did have a question saying they have an error handshake failed. Key is unknown. So uh, yeah, so this this is probably related to the GitHub uh, key issue that they had about a month ago. So what we need to do is clean out your known host uh, file for those SSH keys because they changed their schema, right? They're using a, di a different schema now for those keys. And I don't have the command uh, 
off the top of my head, but if you go to your known host file, you can remove the, the existing GitHub ones and it'll add them back. Okay, great. Yes. Sorry. I know that uh, many of us had headaches back when GitHub made that change. Exactly. <laughs> And this is that example where I used in my slides where I said, I, you know, looked back through my history to figure out how I got it to work. And I, I saw VI commands in there and I thought, what did I VI in this thing? And I couldn't remember it. And yes. well, yeah, I edited all those things. So. Yes. Um, so I'll also give an overview as we are here, like to remind people the value of GitOps, right? Velocity, security, reliability, um, you know, all these great things we talked about. Um, hopefully now, if many of you have completed these steps and um, you'll be able to follow the next sort of topics we're talking about, um, as well as the fact that I shared um, what we were just doing right now was using something that we've created um, that's free and open source and kind of like Flux, which is also free and open source, but Flux with guardrails so that you can get up and writing right away. Um, one key area is the kind of decision fatigue that could happen um, if you're like, well, I don't know how to think about my repo structure. And so uh, hence this kind of gets you there really quickly. And so Mark will share with us a little bit um, what the thinking was behind uh, designing it in this particular way. Sure. So I'll just uh, kind of give a, a high level overview. So the que questions that we get asked a lot, and I think decision fatigue is a is a great way to, to phrase it is people have asked a lot like, well, how am I supposed to lay things out in my repo so that it makes sense to to flux and for GitOps and all of that. So so we took a, uh, a stab at laying that out. So Weave GitOps has a specific directory structure and you'll notice we put it under a dot folder because we weren't sure uh, that we would own the entire repository at that point. So that's why it's a dot directory in there to say, hey, you know, everything under Weave GitOps is kind of managed by uh, Weave GitOps itself. So that's why it starts underneath that directory. But but really it breaks down into the, the different workloads that you want to run. So you if if you notice when we did the install, we required a config repo parameter and we needed that repository that David had. So what that did is it set up the uh, Git ops of the Git ops uh, controllers in your cluster. So if I look under clusters here and I happen to have two of them tied to this repository, if I look in this one here, you'll notice there's a system and a user there. So under system is going to be everything that is needed in my cluster to run Git ops itself. And under user is going to be everything that I want to do uh, that are my individual workloads. So uh, what we decided to do is that we would have controllers and definitions in the cluster that are pointing at these directories uh, in here, and we want it to be self-managing. So you'll notice there's a Flux system customization resource and a Flux user customization resource. So if I look at the user one, it's going to point at your repository, but for the user workloads. So the reason for that separation is to say, well, you may want to sync uh, uh, your workloads at different uh, frequencies uh, or different intervals uh, between user and system. And again, system is where we want to see that more of the system uh, workloads live. So if you're familiar with Linux, uh, this is where you would say, well, user bin is equivalent to system and user local bin is equivalent to your user aspect. So you'll notice in here that there's a customization file this just tells Flux, hey, these are the resources I want applied to my cluster when you sync the system directory. And we have the same structure for the user side of the house. So what this provides is that level of indirection between what the cluster needs to be running itself, system directory, and the applications that I have deployed. So you'll notice here, I have uh, four applications deployed into my cluster. Uh, at the user level. So now if I go look at it, apps here, which we just, David walked us through an example. If I take a look at the Loki stack, for example, it has an app uh, definition file. It has a customization. So again, this direction says, I want you to load these two resources in order to sync my app, which happened to be here. One of them is a Helm release, which is again, so I deployed this as a Helm chart to my cluster. And one is the definition of where to pull that Helm chart from. So the directory structure, high level pieces, you're going to have apps and clusters. You want the clusters to be self-managed. Why do I want them to be self-managed? Well, if I have to update Flux, I want to update the files in the Flux system and I want it to update itself. 
I don't want to have to go to the cluster, perform operations on it uh, that I don't have a history of. And then same thing for apps. I want to pull those in as I'm deploying them to clusters. I just want to reference in the user section to the apps I want deployed there. And again, these will then point at other instances. So if we look at this one here, it's going to pull these resources, which happen to pull from a remote repository here that I have this here one here, which is what we just did with the uh, pod info example there. So, uh, so the directory layout is important there. The levels of indirection are important there. Uh, and then one piece, I, I'm going to stop there. Any questions on, on kind of that overview of the directory structure? Yeah. Also, let us know if you're, yeah, you're here for like the overview of Kubernetes and GitOps, whether that's um, helpful or maybe too much information in one go. Yeah, let us know. We're constantly evolving uh, this workshop and obviously it's meant for um, it to help you. So uh, let us know. Um, in the meantime, we did have a few questions and people were helping each other. Um, I said, is there a way, making sure I didn't miss one by mistake, is there a way to run the UI on a different IP? I'm running on a remote system and it says running on 0000, 000 9001. Um, and someone else said, I got the same IP question. Don't know if it was related to uh, oh that person was saying i'll try running the i'll try ssh tunneling a local browser so i'm not sure if that was the path or if you had other uh, advice uh was this uh they sshed into a remote server that was headless and doesn't have because that yeah would be uh where you'd want to either set up a um a proxy into that machine or connect directly. Yeah, that's what I suspected it was. Yes, SSH to headless Kubernetes cluster. Yeah, so you can set up a SSH tunnel like you like you set up there. Uh, that would open it up and allow you to talk to that port because it's going to open up the local host, uh, the port on that local machine. Okay. Um, all right. Well, it's great to see people are still <laughs> here and sticking with it. I can't tell the UI to run on the primary IP rather than 0000. zero, zero, zero. Uh, I'm trying to remember on the port. No, I think, I think there's some assumptions made in the way the UI is run via that command line that's there. Uh, but there is an alternative way that we can uh, run it. So you can actually talk to the uh, the UI running in the cluster, uh, but we, we haven't covered that aspect here. Uh, in, in the, so you can port forward to the actual UI running in the cluster. Okay, then, okay. should we take the next steps? Uh, I don't know, was that an error that was shared right now? Or? Yeah, I, I think guess. people are uh, struggling with the UI only running locally. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. Please keep your uh, chat questions. We'll address them. Uh, but now we're going to shift a little bit to, um, you know, looking forward to what this gives you, the shiny things that uh, we'd like to show you, and we will continue to help you with in Slack after this workshop. Uh, David. Yes. Let me share my screen again so now we're gonna first make sure the app is really running and i mean in the series setup you would configure an ingress but we're gonna use something more simple we're gonna use the port forward so you copy this line here and we're gonna start our port forward and if we go now to this address we can see our port info app is up and running so we made our first GitOps deployment, which is great. So if we really think through what we did, we never wrote kubectl applied to anything. We, we basically, we pointed it to a repo where our manifest for the deployment were living and everything else was handled by our GitOps engine on, in reality, Flux, who took care of the deployment. 
So we shifted really left. Um, so let's see what it gives us. Let's assume there's, for example, um, a bad actor. Let's let's say somebody goes in and does something horrendous, which is deleting a pot, right? Let's let's say somebody really is messing with it. What we're gonna do is we're gonna run this command qcutl delete um, deployment front end in the namespace test. So this is gonna targeting this pod here. I am watching this namespace and gonna delete it. So this would be, for example, something bad happens. Uh, could be a human mistake or whatever. And why are we showing this? Because you will see the benefits of GitOps. So now you can see that the status here is terminating and it's bringing down the pod, but um, this will only be a few seconds before our GitOps reconciling engine will pick it up that this is not what we have declared. And, and this declaration has not changed. This is still the same we have in the repo where our deployment manifest sits. And like magic, it will come up again without doing anything. So we just need to give it a few seconds and it will come up like magic. Let's give it a second. It feels quite long, but this is only, I don't know what the interval is. I think it's configured to one minute, right? Yes, now you can see without doing anything, our, our front end came back. So, I mean, Depends on the timing, this was quite long because um, probably we have an interval configured of a minute. So this means it shakes every one minute. It, it reaches out and looks if this is still in sync. And if not, it will make sure that um, the right thing gets applied. So here you can see how from one moment to another, your, your environment gets pretty resilient because your source of truth is Git and there's some source control around it. It's you can see you have some audit, you know what's happening around it. But now let's assume we have a different scenario and we want to make a desired change. How does this look in, in the GitOps world? Let's assume we want to change pot info UI color. And I, I guess this is why I cloned it because if I want to, to make normally, I would probably do this change locally. But this is, doesn't really matter. We can do it as well just here. We go to the repo, which is pod info deploy. Imagine this would be probably your app team and they don't mess with your config repo. They mess with their repo where they're managing their app. So they go to, to front end. And if they do this on their local machine or they do it like probably more likely on the local machine, and they're gonna change here this value, pot info UI color. Um, no, this was the wrong thing. Let me make sure that we copy the right value, which is six times the eight. Where, where are we? Yeah. Uh, okay, this looks good. And now we're gonna be in a normal workflow, which we know from software development, which makes as well a lot of sense in operation, which is basically instead of committing this directly to the main branch, we're gonna create a new branch and start a pull request. And this pull request is change color. Um, and we're gonna propose the changes. And now you can see that you could basically you have your normal pipeline where you check for, for errors, for, for security threats and so on. Um, and then basically you have the human review, the peer review, and somebody of your team is gonna say, oh, this looks good to me. We're gonna, we're gonna approve this change, right? And this is what we mean um, operating by pull request. It gives you a different sense of, um, quality because you have the peer review. So we're gonna merge this. We're gonna delete the branch. We don't need it anymore. And that's basically it. And we're gonna see what's happening. So now we changed this. This is applied to our Git repo. And 
now what should happen in a second is the new pot comes up the old pot will go down and then we need to just restart our pot for water because this pot doesn't exist anymore um like this and if we go now to our front end it's gray we we made the change so now comes the last part of the story let's assume that this change was catastrophic our error rate went really up we we need to do something right and this is the last benefit of GitOps, right it gives you so much confidence to your team because you don't need to worry see we're gonna we're gonna roll back in in a couple of seconds so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go at our pull request. We're gonna see this. This is a catastrophic pull request we introduced that brought up really our error rate or introduced a big bug. And we're gonna say revert. And the revert itself will basically, oh, this is, no, this is not good. Sorry, this is the wrong repo. This would be catastrophic. We would basically de delete. Um, yep this was my mistake um we're gonna do the same here this is a catastrophic pull request this is where we updated the deployment.yml with change the color and we're gonna revert this change we're gonna make sure that this will go out and this will again if you want create a pull request um some peer review happens and we're gonna merge this pull request that um and we're going to delete the branch. And now we're going to see how this will introduce again the process where this the old pod will basically the new pod comes up. Now Kubernetes terminates the old pod once this is up, once this is ready. Start to switch traffic and bring the, the old pod down. And again, we will need to restart our pod for water because this doesn't exist anymore and but if we go now here oh wonder it's blue again and we roll back in a couple of seconds so this really highlights what you get if you do git ops um, you have as well this order tray you can check who applied at what time what change and you can basically map this together with an error rate which has gone up and and so on so basically you get a better understanding what's really going on with your system so this is why it's so powerful and why a small team is capable to run a huge platform this is basically it i think we we did now the whole getting started guide yes this is complete that's it excellent all right so i've posted we our goal here is first to make sure that um everybody is or most people are able to complete the getting started steps um, I've posted if anybody is stuck um, or happy to help with errors let us know um, otherwise uh, we'll just kind of leave you with uh, some uh, things to be thinking about I don't know if um, I know Mark Emais had to step away for a second but I don't know if you're back we were going to talk about just um, you know what this means for you uh, for the values that we talked about in the beginning in terms of security velocity reliability um in terms of disaster recovery using GitOps. um you know we have the mythical story of uh, and you've demoed a little bit of this um the mythical story of us having an engineer make an error and bringing the entire system down and us being able to um bring it all back in i think it was less than an hour um, because you know we had state uh, set and it was just a matter of applying this thing that later we started calling GitOps. Uh, and so yeah, if there's more that it, you want to share that they can try um, here, let us know. Uh, Mark or David, what what are ways that they can be um, trying trying out disaster recovery scenarios uh, with the setup that they just did? I mean, we did a bit, right? We did the malicious yeah. sector. They can, I mean, they can delete all pods. They can delete the namespace. They can delete any of the Kubernetes objects. Um, yeah. They will all come back. Yes, excellent. Yeah, good to enumerate that. 
Um, secondly, uh, I know we're going to talk a little bit about um, Helm charts, and we got that question. Uh, I don't know if Mark, you were going to answer some questions, and I know you're helping someone also in the chat. Uh, sure. Yeah. So the uh, so we are able to deploy Helm charts uh, directly into the the cluster. The one I showed when I showed that directory structure, the Loki stack is actually a Helm chart that we that uh, did deploy there. Uh, directly into the system. So you need to set up a couple of things. If you've used Helm, right, you have to add the, the Helm repository to Helm and then you, you know, install Helm and all that. But we, uh, we want it to all be declarative. So what we want you to tell us instead is, I want this Helm chart to run it right from this repository. And that's basically what you do when you run the command to add a Helm chart to your weave GitOps environment. So we set up underneath the covers, uh, the ability to pull from that repository and generate a Helm release that wraps that Helm chart so that it can all be declarative. Yes, absolutely. Um, and then we had a question of, you know, oh, is this all Flux here? And uh, yes, uh, we, you know, we are the creators of Flux. Uh, as I mentioned, we're in the CNCF and we are very, very close to um, reaching graduation. Uh, I know people have questions about Argo. Argo are good friends of ours. Um, and, you know, we, we love to um, actually look at ways that we might um, work together further. Uh, but a little plug on our side, you know, as, when I say we're really close to graduation, one really important thing is that um, we just went through a security audit run by an external company that the CNCF um, provided us. And it was very, um, gratifying to see the results of the audit and how you know the design of flux has just really been uh, very uh, secure and with security in mind and so we're actually just completing um, some of the steps from that audit which are primarily around um, documentation so we're really just working on some documentation steps to um, make sure that we're informing people of you know what what they need to do to be using flux out at its fullest so again many options there you know love the argo team they have tons of um, great offerings um, through their project um, but we further feel excited about um, you know our our project and um, why as i mentioned we have these great enterprise end users who really trust flux as well as the integrators such as microsoft amazon red hat um, vmware and d2iq who you know see that this is really enterprise ready and so we um, are basically waiting for the TOC to complete their um, elections and to be together on February 4th. And we will be moving through those final steps of getting Flux to graduation. And so we've gotten all the guidance we need and we feel really good about that. So yes, that is why uh, we ourselves have um, built our own product on Flux because we ourselves trust Flux to be the best way that we can deliver these capabilities to our enterprise customers. Uh, so I think that's actually a great place for us to um, wind down with a little bit of a plug. Uh, as I mentioned, we've been focusing all on free and open source um, ways to get started. Um, but of course, our company also has an enterprise product that um, David and, and Mark are involved in. And so for that, like if you're taking this and you find it really useful and you would like to share this with your team, um, please, um, you'll have an email from me, reach out to me and we're happy to demo this further if you're looking for um, enterprise level capabilities, like with our enterprise products, we've GitOps Enterprise, you can do cluster lifecycle management, you can uh, take it at a whole different level, right? This is, is kind of like your starter kit if you're just getting started, but if you need this at a really reliable and um, supported level, we do have an enterprise product and, uh, and we have a great support team as well that can uh, even start you on your Kubernetes journey. As I mentioned in the beginning, we as a company are dedicated to everybody's successful uh, cloud native journey and journey through GitOps. Uh, the GitOps maturity model, as I showed from zero to three, uh, we are here to make sure that uh, you have what you need um, either through the community or through a paid product to be successful. So with that, any final questions, any final comments from our guest speakers here? If not, uh, thank you so, so much for sticking with us through this. Uh, please email me a response with any feedback if it you know, wasn't working for you or what we could do better or what more you'd like to hear. 
Um, we are here to keep evolving these, um, you know, if you want a shorter version, a longer version, whatever, like we are happy to provide these for you so that you are successful. Uh, again, thank you to Stacy, our community manager for putting these together and thanks to Mark and David for leading us and thanks especially to all of you for joining us and um, it's great to see all the comments. Yes, all the um, responses. It's great to have it to be interactive and to uh, make sure that we're providing you with what you came here for. So with that. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And um, oh, and a plug tomorrow, there is a, um, a flux uh, intro talk. And then next Wednesday are steps that go through um, how to get started with flux, both with Weave GitOps Core, as we mentioned today, and with flux itself. So that'll be just like a one hour talk going you through it. So not like in a workshop form. So uh, Stacy will send you those links and also has posted our um, meetup links here. So if you want to learn more, we've got talks tomorrow and next Wednesday uh, with additional topics around this. So thank you so much again. And um, I will turn off my camera, but I won't uh, say goodbye because I see that there's still chats going on. But with that, I'll say goodbye and thank you, Mark. I'll see you next time. Bye.